Welcome everyone to the Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collections and University Archives Anniversary Speaker Series. My name is Stacey Krimk and I'm curator of manuscripts and cello music and I'm with my colleague cello music cataloger Mac Nelson. Today we're having a conversation with one of our favorite researchers and collaborators for the UNCG cello music collection. If you have any questions during the program, please feel free to ask them in chat. We're keeping things informal, so feel free to comment or ask questions at any point. Now let me introduce our guest for today. Born in Kyiv, Ukraine, cellist Yuri Romanovich immigrated to the United States with his family. His teachers include cellists Stephen Gerber and Robert Demain and composer James Hardway. Leonovich earned his Doctor of Musical Arts degree from the Cleveland Institute of Music. He is a recipient of the Hope and Stanley Adelstein Prize for Excellence in Composition and Performance. Following his vision to expand the standard cello repertoire, Leonovich wrote his DMA research document on Gaspar Casado's cello concertos. Leonovich holds the assistant cello professor position at Bob Jones University in Greenville, South Carolina. His students are performing and teaching all over the world from the Indianapolis Symphony to Guam. His students have been accepted to the Cleveland Institute of Music, Michigan State University, the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, University of Memphis, Penn State, Columbus State, and Appalachian State, among others, and have participated in musical festivals such as the National Repertory Orchestra, Prisma Festival, Masterworks Festival, and this Tennessee Cello Workshop and the South Carolina Cello Choir. Thank you for joining us today, Yuri. Thank you. That was quite the introduction. <laughs> I'm really happy to be really happy to be here. Uh, I'm working with my favorite curator. Oh, well, thank uh, you. And Mac. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're amazing. You, you introduced me to the Segoviana a few years ago. And it's a great work. I'm hoping to perform it one day. We absolutely want to see that. Um, so tell us a bit about yourself. How did you become a cellist? Uh, so uh, my grandfathers uh, from both sides were musicians. Uh, my grandfather on my mom's side actually went to the Kiev Conservatory uh, for a trombone uh, before World War II. And then the war uh, kind of forced him to stop and he became an electrician. And uh, the grandfather on the other side, on my father's side, uh, was an amateur clarinetist and worked on the clarinet assembly line. Uh, so I actually did not uh, know the music side of the grandfathers, although I did know. Uh, I lived actually with uh, uh, my maternal grandfather for uh, 13 years, but uh, the only thing that I heard was him playing Beethoven uh, on uh, a record player. Uh, so when I went to public school, I actually really wanted to be uh, in a band and meaning uh, like a rock band or a jazz band, something like that. And uh, when I signed up for band, uh, they were talking about flutes and trumpets and percussion and I wasn't really feeling it. Uh, so uh, the orchestra teacher recruited me on the first day and uh, I knew that I was not going to be a violinist because my parents were not uh, for high tones. So I wanted to be one of the cool kids and play uh, double bass. Uh, but those were taken, so I took the next largest thing, which was a cello. Uh, but I told people that I played the double bass for probably the first year because uh, that was the cool instrument and I didn't want to be the loser playing the cello. Uh, so yeah, I started in the public school system in Southfield, Michigan, and uh, uh, kind of uh, self-taught for the first uh, six months. Uh, I mean, uh, I did have a daily orchestra, but there was uh, a lot of self-teaching. Like, I wanted to learn how to read the score, so I learned alto clef and uh, treble clef, started purchasing music uh, at a at the same time, around the same time. And uh, I really got uh, into music seriously when 
I found out that there was uh, my favorite piece, the Baccarini Minuet in A major in the Suzuki books. I really wanted to learn that, uh, but then uh, that first year, uh, so I did. I, I actually don't know what it sounded like. Uh, my first uh, orchestra teacher has uh, that tape somewhere, but uh, I've been begging her to uh, to digitize it, but uh, she has not gotten to it yet. Uh, so maybe I'll be disappointed at what I heard, I hear. Um, uh, but uh, also around that same time, I discovered Dover scores at Borders Books. For those of you who remember Borders, they actually had a pretty uh, big collection of Dover scores. And uh, one of my first Dover scores was uh, uh, Vivaldi's Four Seasons and other concertos from Opus 8. And I actually did not know that Vivaldi had 12 concertos in Opus 8. So right there at age 12 or around that time, I already started learning information beyond uh, the popular, uh, the pop culture, like Four Seasons, or I also saw Dvorak Slavonic dances and uh, actually had a sort of an argument on the last day of sixth grade with a seventh grader because uh, 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 I said that I really liked Dvorak's Slavonic dances uh, because uh, I heard one of them at uh, on the collection CD. So, you know, I wanted to learn more about them. And uh, this uh, classmate said, uh, Dvorak has only one Slavonic dance and that's Slavonic dance number one. And uh, right there in sixth grade, I thought I had the, the critical thinking necessary to know that if there's a number one, there has to be at least a number two. And Dvorak actually has 16 Slavonic dances. So it was really fun. I, I just kind of fell into this serious music uh, uh, study. Uh, we also had uh, Harmony House Classical uh, in Detroit, uh, fully uh, supported by the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. And Amy Yarvi uh, was uh, featured on their uh, commercials. So that was fun. And uh, one day I decided to go in there and there was a cellist uh, at, the, the, at the cash register and she told me what I needed to learn. And uh, so she handed me Casals Bach, the two uh, CD set, and the VHS, uh, two VHS uh, set of Rostropovich playing Bach. I don't remember what else she uh, gave, but uh, I was uh, right there at age 12 already uh, within the year, uh, introduced to the Bach suites, as well as uh, other standard repertoire from like the orchestral repertoire too. Just out of professional curiosity, um, because I, I deal with a lot of cellists' collections, uh, and I'm interested in knowing about how they grow. What size was your sheet music collection by the time you got to college, or by the time you got to Curtis? Uh, so uh, I actually went to a state school for uh, my undergrad, Wayne State University. Uh, but by the time I was 18, uh, I had no filter. I needed to have every Dover score that I saw. So I actually had the complete Mahler symphonies, uh, complete Beethoven symphonies. Uh, I mean, I would say I probably owned around 70% of the Dover orchestral collection. And uh, uh, in addition to that, uh, cello parts to major works. And when I say major works, uh, I would I mean, like complete Tchaikovsky symphonies, complete Beethoven symphonies, complete Brahms symphonies, uh, like the Bizet suites, uh, all, the, all those things. Uh, and uh, you know, cello parts, uh, because uh, one of my friends dared to introduce me at, to Lux Music Library, which is in Madison Heights, uh, Michigan, uh, still there today. Uh, and it's a Detroit suburb. So I had a, quite a large uh, orchestral score and orchestral park collection. Um, in addition to the things that uh, my teacher recommended uh, that I learn and some things that he recommended that I don't learn, I still have those. <laughs> so in addition to performance, you're also a, a composer and an arranger. Can you tell us how you got started with that? 
So composing, uh, I felt like I wanted to express myself, but I don't think I had the tools. So I instinctually did something that uh, Mozart uh, and other young composers did uh, when they were first starting is uh, uh, either arranging or somehow uh, changing up uh, pieces uh, like for example, Mozart's, uh, some of his first piano concertos are by C.P. Bach, uh, sonatas that he orchestrated. So I took cello sonatas like uh, Vivaldi and Marcello, and uh, I created uh, kind of uninformed orchestral uh, accompaniments to them. Um, something that uh, if I see my kids having uh, Kind of a leaning towards composition, I would probably uh, give them to or have them uh, study with a composer or a counterpoint teacher or some kind of theory teacher, because I definitely had the hunger for it. Uh, uh, that that's uh, kind of demonstrated because I had uh, thirty cello concertos that I wrote uh, by the time I was eighteen years old, uh, and some of them I've uh, rewritten into short pieces. So I definitely had the hunger. I like if I heard a Mahler symphony, I wanted to borrow something from Mahler. If I heard uh, Beethoven, I wanted to use some of that. But uh, I wish I knew form and counterpoint, most of all, as a teenager. As far as arrangements, uh, uh, my first teacher, whose name is David Levine, he still lives in Michigan. Uh, he. Uh, his dad, who was in his 90s at the time, had uh, kind of uh, amateur old timers quartet. And by quartet, it was probably a double quartet or a triple quartet that he tried to fit into his living room. So on Saturday mornings, uh, my dad would take me to uh, Abe Levine's uh, living room and I would play Mozart quartets and Haydn quartets. And when I would get bored with the cello parts, I would switch it up and play maybe a second violin part or sometimes viola if they really were hurting for violas so arranging uh, kind of came out of that uh, arranging for me was uh, more like an orchestration exercise or if i heard a violin piece or a piano piece i wanted to play that on the cello now i'm not saying that my cello teacher approved of that but some of my uh, earliest arrangements are Vignowski violin pieces like Ayers Roos um, and uh, lists of Hungarian Rhapsody number no. five, which uh, at some point I typeset and offered on onto IMSLP back in its uh, wee years, probably around 20 years ago, I, I started posting that. And what role has archival research played in your scholarship for cello? So this is kind of a winding road, uh, but I knew about UNCG archives uh, long before I uh, took the plunge into the archives. Uh, so uh, some of my first archive uh, usage was when I decided that I'm going to be the one to finish Tchaikovsky's cello concerto. So I dared uh, to write uh, Tchaikovsky research. Uh, and Brett Langston wrote me back and he was uh, more than happy to share typesets, uh, manuscripts uh, uh, on Sibelius. And uh, also showed me where to find in books uh, different snippets, uh, like if I want to see Tchaikovsky's original writings. Um, so uh, that was when I seriously took up research and that uh, that was part of this completion project. Uh, but uh, back when I was 13, 14, I, I knew I wanted to get something more out of my library. So we had this probably 900 square foot of building uh, in Franklin Village where I lived uh, in high school. Uh, and uh, I used to go to them and uh, one day they introduced me to interlibrary loan. 
So at, at that point in my early teens, uh, I, I knew it was like a $5 charge or something like that, but that wasn't a big deal. I guess for me, it wasn't because my parents were paying and, um, I would tell my little library what I wanted and then, uh, they would put in an order and, uh, this book would arrive until the wrong book arrived. And I was wondering why is that? Uh, and at some point after that, I, I realized that there's this thing called world cat. Uh, and, uh, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but you used to need a password to get into the OCLC part of world cat. It wasn't just like a free for all. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I was using the wrong link. Uh, but I realized that I could actually find the book that I'm looking for on world cat. I give the OCLC number to the interlibrary loan department or whoever sat at the front desk at this tiny library. And they would give me the book that I need, like the exact edition that I'm looking for. By the way, the book that uh, I got that was wrong was uh, the St. Sans Suite Opus 8, uh, 16, the original version that I already owned a copy of. And I was looking for the revised version that uh, he uh, redid when he was 84. And that, that piece has stuck with me, I guess, for over 20 years, that piece has been with me. I just uh, performed it with our university orchestra. So yeah, it's kind of like I'm put into these situations where I need to research. Um, and uh, I think my next big plunge was uh, when Stacy posted uh, find that piece on uh, Facebook back in 2016. And uh, silly me at the, the decided that I'm going to figure out who wrote that piece. Uh, so uh, that's when uh, my relationship with the UNCG started. And uh, I started looking through their digital collection through uh, finding aids. I found a passion for finding aids. Uh, it's uh, it's great uh, when you know what you're looking at, because uh, you know you could look at a a derivative formula or I don't know anything calculus related, and uh, that can look like a different language, and it is. Uh, but once you Kind of get your feet wet it's uh, not as intimidating when you're looking at uh, uh, at a finding aid that's 20 pages sometimes 50 sometimes over 100 pages uh, i really like the finding aids where you can uh, click Control f and uh, do a keyword search so uh, that's kind of where the big step came of to research just uh, six years ago and by the way, I did uh, identify two of the three pieces that uh, Stacy was looking for. So uh, that was great news. But through all of that, I, as I was looking, I was uh, communicating with uh, archives all over the world and people wanted to help. Uh, like when I had an educated guest that one of these pieces was uh, Percy Granger uh, I contacted the head guy of the Percy Granger Society, and he said it's not. But then I started looking more into Percy Granger and his music. So, or uh, I think Stanley Smith, that was another guy, I guess. Um, so a lot of composers that I did not know, I was now learning about, and uh, some of them made it into my repertoire. I had some notes and what I wanted to say about this because I'm actually really passionate about research. Uh, I probably spend uh, most of my time looking for things just out of curiosity. Uh, every evening I try to learn uh, something like uh, etymology of a word that comes into my head. Uh, so I'm always learning. Uh, well, here in the notes, uh, I, I just, I, I want to Give you something concrete about research. Uh, having a basic knowledge uh, 
uh, of notation software doesn't make you an engraver and searching Google uh, or doing the manuscript uh, note checking doesn't make you a music research. Although knowing how to use Google and reading manuscript is uh, important to research. Something that helped me with uh, uh, getting deeper into research is uh, on Internet Cello Society. Um, on Facebook, uh, there are people who ask, what is this note or what is this tempo marking? And I truly want to help those people, uh, but it's uh, not as easy as uh, just finding a manuscript and saying, well, here it is, because uh, you could get a manuscript version of a piece, but then that piece was rewritten a few times. So you don't know what the composer's final say is, or did the composer even want a final say? Is the published version the final say? Is it? I don't know. So actually, uh, last year, about 18 months ago, I uh, decided to do the deepest research I've ever done and actually pay out of pocket over $500 for some Prokofiev manuscripts at uh, the, I forget, it's a, a library in Moscow, and uh, actually got the 220 page uh, handwritten score of Symphonia Concertante uh, by Prokofiev. And to me, that seems like the final say, even though Rostropovich was the one who finally published it uh, with uh, uh, the Soviet state publishers and uh, something that ended up through Boozy and Hawks, uh, what we most of us have played from. Uh, I found that uh, there's kind of a middle ground version between uh, 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 some publications. So was Rostropovich trying to republish something with corrections from the manuscript? Uh, I actually don't know. I haven't talked to Rostropovich and now it's too late. But uh, as an editor, I need to make uh, educated guesses and uh, in studying the cello part, I didn't go so deep as to study every single orchestral part. But in studying the cello part, I made a, a critical commentary that's available on my website of uh, the Symphonia Concertante uh, based uh, on the manuscript um, and uh, the first edition score and two different editions of the cello part and the cello part that's in the piano score, I guess. Maybe that's five five sources comparing those, and they're all different. So, um, dealing with uh, uh, different archives around the world is also really fun. Uh, just uh, to get uh, how they respond, uh, and uh, are they happy to hear from me, or are they not happy to hear from me? Are they going to provide me? A, manuscripts free or ch of charge, or am I going to be paying an arm and a leg for like $1 or $2 per scanned copy? I've had, uh, I think, many, many different permutations of experiences. Uh, the German archives are the most on top of it, I think. And uh, some of them you have to pay and some of them you don't. Uh, a few months ago, I contacted a library in uh, Germany, I forget which city it was. Uh, and uh, they actually offered to scan uh, free of charge and thank me for giving them a heads up that they have these manuscripts and they're now available for free on uh, their digital website. Uh, then uh, uh, another really good archive uh, and that I work with, but you have to pay some. And their website is a little confusing, so you actually need to contact them. But they've been really helpful, and that's uh, the National Library of France. Uh, so they have an online order form, uh, which is really confusing because if you say that you want the entire thing, you have to pay like hundreds of dollars. But uh, then they have a choice of uh, do a page by page. And that's a lot cheaper, but they don't say what page everything is. So you actually need to contact them and find out how many pages you're going to need uh, scanned. So I got Saint-Saëns 
uh, the Swedes from them. Uh, plus, they also have a huge uh, collection already on there, so you can search the uh, Gallica uh, catalog. Uh, but I, also, I got the Saint Sans Suite and uh, uh, Gossex Gavat when I was uh, off to prove uh, that the Gavat was not a real piece by Gossek. I learned that it was a real piece by Gossek coming from uh, Rosina. And I was happy to know, like, you know, sometimes you learn or you want to prove something wrong, but you prove that you're the one that's wrong. And I'm still happy that I know what it is. Um, so I had a great experience uh, there. Uh, American uh, uh, archives are also really good. Uh, they uh, they want to help. Sometimes they want to help, but don't know how. Uh, that's how I got uh, the connection in Moscow for Prokofiev, because a part of the Prokofiev archive is at Columbia University, I think. So they got me in touch uh, in Moscow and also with the Prokofiev lawyer who knows the copyrights. And I was hoping that he wasn't charging me per minute on our phone calls. Um, so but because I deal with a lot of American composers and my uh, research uh, uh, for uh, UNCG, uh, the, the identification, uh, I actually deal a lot with the American composers. Uh, so I'm uh, dealing with American uh, uh, archives, which is uh, much easier for me uh, to work with as far as the language. Uh, because I know how to write uh, a good letter in, uh, in English. Uh, I had to get some pointers because I haven't, I've never written a formal letter in Russian. I left before uh, I was taught that. I had to ask my mom how to not insult people uh, in asking and exactly what information I need to mention. Um, uh, with Germany, I just write in English. With Czech Republic, I just write in English. I think they understand that uh, when I say I'm from the US, they understand, they, they give me benefit of the doubt. And uh, sometimes they get broken German back to me. And it's great because I know that sometimes if I write in Czech, uh, it's broken Czech. Hopefully it's not uh, broken Russian. I try to check everything, no pun intended. Uh, I had a really awesome experience and really fast turnaround uh, when I was looking for the Haydn Sea. Um, and that was uh, kind of fun because uh, for the longest time I've been wanting to get my hands on that manuscript and then finally found uh, in the back of the Henley edition where it's located. So I wrote this uh, Czech museum and this uh, very jolly lady uh, wrote me back. She said, of course, yeah, just pay and they'll send it to you like right away. So I that was the fastest transaction with uh, a foreign archive. Uh, that was probably within a couple of hours. And actually, I, I need to thank this lady because uh, she uh, taught me how to use WISE. Uh, before that, I had to make a trip to my bank and I had to pay the flat fee for an international bank transfer. And I was like, I'm really not made out of money to be dropping $50 or so every single time I need to make a $15 bank transfer to Germany or whatever. So she taught me to use WISE. Uh, so I've been using that and it's much easier to come from my own home. Uh, just a quick transfer and then uh, you get your product. Uh, I'm not gonna mention any names, but there was a uh, a uh, recent about a year ago, I was doing uh, a research on an American cellist composer. You just go through your head and find out which one that is. Uh, I got through uh, to well, actually, I was working with the Library of Congress because I wanted to get this uh, cellist score for a first edition of this particular cello concerto, and. Um, I got in touch with uh, the 
the president of this composer society who was at first unwilling to help and was kind of mean in her response to me. Uh, and so I thought I'd go around her, just go to the uh, Library of Congress. It's in public domain. It's not a big deal. I, I've done this before. And uh, they said that I actually need permission from this lady. Uh, and that was my head was uh, hung very low that I had to go back to this lady and uh, uh, write her professionally and kindly back, asking her for permission. Uh, to get this particular manuscript. And in the end, she uh, turned out to be a really nice lady uh, and wanted to help and uh, actually uh, wanted to help publish uh, through the society, which I haven't taken her up on it. Uh, but um, uh, sometimes uh, it looks like you might as well just quit. Like, do I care about this piece? And if I already made the first step, I cared enough to make that first step, so I might as well go all the way and uh, get that manuscript. I've had uh, kind of a weird collector's notice before from an archive saying that I owe them money. And uh, I was, so I emailed uh, this archive and I was like, is this serious or, are you trying, or is someone trying to scam me to get my bank information? And they said that they've never received a payment from me. And so I was super apologetic because I like to pay right away. Uh, so and this was for uh, a manuscript of Haydn's G major violin concerto, which is also available. That was kind of a trick that they played on me that I had to pay for their digitization, but then they posted it online. So. It was uh, my whatever 53 euros that pay for that digitization. So, you know, just have an open mind as you're researching. Don't be afraid to take that first step and writing someone. Uh, the worst that can happen is that they don't write you back and then let a couple of weeks go and uh, write them again. And then let it maybe a month go if they don't write back and uh, I just, uh, I know from personal experience that if you keep knocking, they'll open the door. Uh, specifically thinking of Casa Do. Uh, I've written the Casa Do archive for like five years and they never responded. So I let a year go and then I wrote them back and I got what I wanted within a couple of days. So yeah, don't hang your head too low. Right, so let's turn to the two mystery pieces you identified. Um, and to frame this, Mac, uh, as our cello music cataloger, is kind of our final uh, line of defense and identification um, of materials. Uh, Mac, can you talk about why we have unidentified pieces in our collection? Sure, sure. Um, there's much to it. Uh, probably the um largest factor is that um i'm one cataloger uh we uh catalog at the item level which um is certainly not typical of of archives in other words um at the item level rather than describing or rather than um creating a collective record or simply listing basic data we, our description is in great detail um, and it's very time consuming to do that. Um, the reason we do it, and it's, I mean, it, it is invaluable to the access we create to the collection, but the, what is called metadata, the, um, all the details that we include in each individual record, make that um, item very findable and in fact, even more so in the age of the large search engine, that metadata boosts our items to the top of the results list. So we believe in the uh, item level cataloging, but it takes a great deal of time. And I don't think I have to explain to anyone uh, here, uh, we have, it's a really large, large archive. There's a great deal of cataloging to do. So that's the, that's the most fundamental uh, reason. Now, I do give myself time uh, to do some searches. 
um, which uh, you know I, I have to limit the time on them. But I have solved some mysteries before. Uh, the best way to uh, find out uh, how time consuming it can be, and Yuri, I'm sure you're going to talk about this, but there is that little item that uh, was it, I think six years, I won't steal your thunder, but these searches into unidentified partial manuscripts, for instance, um, they, they very quickly begin to eat up day after day uh, when you're doing it. Um, so it's fascinating. I just have to limit myself. I have to remember uh, what um, I was taught early on, and that is you have to leave something for the researchers to do. Um, so if I can make the identification, it's really gratifying. I'm like you, Yuri, I really enjoy it. But um, my, my work would be uh, very slow indeed if I followed uh, every, every uh, trail that was mapped for me by a question uh, arising uh, from the collection. And I should add here that um, as, as I think most of you probably know, um, when you have a, a major library uh, from a, 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 a cellist uh, who uh, has had a long career and accrued uh, a great deal of material, uh, some of them are really careful about it. Fritz Mag in our, our um, collection, for instance, it's very rare to find incomplete uh, scores uh, and even incomplete Xerox copies in Fritz Mogg's collection. And I am told by a couple of his students, it's because he was, he was generous, but he would loan you the item and he would wait for you to bring it back after you had made your copies or done whatever you needed to do with his item. Um, we have other, I won't name names on, but we have other um, uh, cellists who clearly loaned and uh, never got their their materials back, or they loaned and the materials came back incomplete, uh, maybe uh, 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 damaged somehow. And some of the collections have far more mysteries than others. Uh, those are the, that, that's the basic reason. And I also, of course, cataloging music at a large music school like this, um, I don't get, I, even though almost all my cataloging with the cello music collection. I also manage all of the music cataloging for, for the university. So uh, I'm, it's, uh, you know, spread thin. Uh, so there you go. Any questions about that, anyone? Also, Mac would have me showing up at his desk demanding to know why he isn't moving faster. So uh, <laughs> there's, there's pressure to make things readily available immediately. And you know what, Stacy? just uh, to quickly add, you and I do a lot of projects together. We do a lot of donor development together, and that's terribly important. We have to make time for that, love to make time for it. It's one of the gratifying aspects of the job, but that often requires uh, some teamwork, and from, from time to time, it can be almost totally consuming. Um, yeah. So there's that element to developing the, the, the larger view of development of the collection. Absolutely. And um, actually, one of the first collections you helped bring in uh, is the first mystery piece we're going to talk about with Yuri. So let's talk about the greenhouse mystery piece. Um, so this was uh, one of the ones I posted online. I'm going to share. Um, share my screen really quick so you can see what it looks like. Okay, so this is an item in the greenhouse collection, and this is one of the ones that Yuri uh, really took quite an effort to, to identify. Can you talk about the, um, the, the, how you investigated the mystery of this piece? So actually, uh, the the Eisenberg piece is what got me started, and mm -hmm. I think I asked you if you had any others, and you sent me this one. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
when you have uh, a name of a piece and you know what the orchestration is, you want to be that quick uh, instant gratification Google Scholar. Uh, you want to type in uh, the name of the piece, type in string quartet or just quartet uh, to broaden the search and uh, uh, be the hero of the day. Uh, say that, yay, I'm done. Uh, but that, that was not the case. Uh, and uh, the, what I was looking for with this particular piece is knowing that it's from the greenhouse collection and having a kind of a peculiar uh, handwriting, I uh, I was uh, connecting with piece, people who would have known greenhouse because the the trail seems kind of fresh with greenhouse just passing away about ten years ago or so, and uh, so I wrote uh, my former teachers like uh, Mary Peckham. Uh, from the Cavani String Quartet, who is now at NEC, and Joel Smirnov, uh, who would have worked with Greenhouse directly at the Juilliard String Quartet. Uh, I wrote them and they had no clue. And I thought, if they have no clue, how am I supposed to have a clue? Because you guys knew the guy. Uh, so, uh, I mean, guy or girl or whoever wrote it, you know, just like the composer. Uh, I uh, they they would have known him through the greenhouse, uh, but uh, I'm getting tangled up. I'm sorry, uh, but uh, in searching for the Eisenberg piece, uh, the way I found this was kind of an afterthought. Uh, searching the newspapers, so after I got a clue for the Eisenberg piece, I searched uh, just typed in the scarce of the Versament. Uh, into the newspaper search and popped out this uh, a piece by Lozerman. It didn't even say Arthur Lozerman, just Lozerman String Quartet, uh, 1920s uh, in Minnesota. Uh, and I thought, how many scarce of diverse amounts can there be for string quartets in an era like the decade where I was placing this piece stylistically? So, uh, then I did my Google Scholar search and found out this uh, about Arthur Loserman and his connection to Garth Newell. Now, I had never heard of Arthur Loserman. This was a brand new composer to me. Uh, so I wrote an email to uh, the contact information to the Garth Newell Festival. And uh, two days later, I get a phone call from Arthur Lozerman's daughter, who's 85 years old, uh, uh, asking me how I came across Arthur Lozerman's piece. And I was still very skeptical, like, are you sure this is the piece? I don't know if you're a musician or can you read music? Because uh, I sent, I think it was uh, the YouTube link that I made uh, like uh, an mp3 file uh, from computer sounds. So I thought maybe uh, maybe you're mistaken or maybe I'm mistaken. I don't know. I was very skeptical about it. And we talked on the phone for like a half an hour maybe and uh, she said uh, that she's holding a manuscript of this piece and I'm like okay I'm still still skeptical. This was the Thanksgiving holiday coming up. So she said after the holiday, she was going to send me a copy of this. So once I received the copy in the same exact handwriting of uh, this particular work, I was then convinced about a week later that this was the work. But this work has never been published. It only exists in a manuscript format in her uh, house and in uh, the uh, uh, UNCG archives, uh, there was no way I could have followed any kind of archive trail to find this piece. It was uh, kind of through circumstantial ev evidence uh, at, in the newspaper that I connected this name to a festival, contacted the festival, and the festival gave my name to the daughter, and the daughter called me. So that was like several degrees of separation between uh, a UNCG and the daughter.
And uh, you actually used this piece uh, for instructional purposes with your students, correct? Yes, so I head up the chamber music program at Bob Jones University. And uh, I asked Bri, please, uh, for this uh, advanced string quartet to uh, learn this short piece in addition to Death and the Maiden that they were already performing. Uh, so uh, they thought it was uh, cool. Uh, it was uh, exciting. I don't know if they felt the gravity that I felt because I had been working on this for at least five years. Uh, and for them, it was uh, a nice typesetting that I just gave them here, learn this three minute piece. So it was kind of surreal to hear this piece live uh, this last April uh, when you had been look, uh, staring at uh, someone's handwriting for the past five or six years. And we're gonna listen to a brief clip of that right now. So that was a very fun, whimsical piece. Yes, it actually has this kind of champagne bottle pop that the violin has to do uh, to hit the bow on the body of the violin. Uh, so uh, at first I thought it was some kind of birthday gift or something, or maybe anniversary gift because it's got that pop. Um, the only other piece I know with a pop like that is uh, uh, Victor Herbert's uh, Royal Sack Polka or Gallop or whatever it is uh, that I played for Christmas program. So uh, yeah, that was that was pretty exciting. And you know what? The quartet could have played an anonymous piece because all the parts were there and uh, I had typeset it uh, a long time ago. So I could have just given them an anonymous thing, but it's so much more profound to know who wrote it and uh, uh, kind of be part of that history. Right. Um, so let's talk about the the Eisenberg mystery piece, which was the first piece, but you're doing a bit of work with Eisenberg this year. So I wanted to save that to last. Um, I'm going to pull that up on my screen if you will uh, kind of talk about what what you felt when you were seeing it when I first posted it and some background. So uh, the, the piece that Stacy's talking about was missing the first page uh, and uh, the title page that's on the other side. Uh, I would have rather had that, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, maybe I, the, I, I love this piece. It's, uh, it reminded me of uh, like uh, neo-romantic Russian music. And it's, uh, the melody of it uh, is kind of Grigian. Uh, Grieg used this da 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 a lot. So it's got that in it. Uh, so I thought maybe it's Greek, maybe it's Granger because everything is in English. Who do I know that writes uh, exclusively in English? Uh, and uh, the penmanship, it, just everything, it, it was killing me for such a long time and I, I wanted to name the, this, this is Granger, or this is, maybe it's Bantock, uh, because there's some uh, piano writing in that that reminds me of Grand Old Bantock's sapphic poem. Um, and uh, there was nothing, so I, I thought, maybe I'll just stick to the handwriting and try to figure out what the handwriting, who wrote it, uh, and disregarding everything else. Uh, and then, uh, Sometime in October, uh, on my really long search, I came across Leo Sowerby. 
So I contacted the Sour Bee Foundation and asked them, is this Sour Bee? And they said, surely it's not. And I've been used to already by that time hearing, surely it's not. Uh, so uh, one day I got the idea to start looking at newspapers.com. And uh, what I did was just uh, type in Maurice Eisenberg cello in the search engine and I got back like hundreds of hits and started going one by one. Uh, and uh, within a half an hour, I was in the 1940s. Uh, and uh, this, I, I was specifically looking for pieces that I don't know because Eisenberg played a lot of pieces that I do know. Uh, like, uh, I know, I know lots of pieces, but like uh, uh, Beethoven sonatas or like Schumann pieces or uh, the Swan or whatever, it, like I know these pieces so I can just move on. So I was uh, just uh, dropping into every single article to see pieces that I don't know. And um, one of the first pieces that I came across that I didn't know was uh, Mary Howe's uh, Ballad Fantasque, uh, which is also in uh, the, uh, UNCG archive. Uh, and I had a feeling that was not it because I, I knew that Stacy would have told me if it was uh, based on the handwriting. Uh, so I continued. And so in the 1940s, I came across this uh, Franz Bornschein uh, Appalachian legend. It was one of the first pieces that I came across that I didn't know. And uh, every time I came across a piece I didn't know, I would do a Google search to see if someone had posted manuscript samples. Uh, and I couldn't believe my eyes. It was like a one-to-one -one match uh, in his handwriting. But by this time, both Stacy and I had become super skeptical about handwriting uh, with regards to this piece. Uh, so, and this was like the weekend before Thanksgiving. Uh, so I wasn't sure how much work I would have been able to do. So I found uh, Franz Bornschein's archive, uh, at, which is at Peabody. And I contacted uh, Matt Testa uh, about it. And uh, he told me he doesn't know much about this piece, but uh, he knows where I can find the uh, the uh, another copy of this uh, work. So uh, this was, uh, I think, the Maryland Cultural Society or something, the Furlong Library. So I wrote them right away and I said, hey, I'm doing research. Uh, I'd, I'd like to see, uh, I'd like to get my hands on this piece. And uh, they weren't responding to me. And I thought, well, let's, it's just Thanksgiving holiday, so they're they're not going to respond. So the week after Thanksgiving, they're still not responding. So I wrote them again uh, because I was like, "This is the piece. It has to be this piece." I'm so sick of looking for this piece. I know this is it because I I see this one to one uh, penmanship. Uh, uh, by the way, it's uh, I'm I'm not being cynical or anything. I I do enjoy research. It's just that sometimes it gets to you. Uh, and uh, finally, someone writes me back. I'm like, yes, you wrote me back. Can you just like take a phone picture of the first page? And uh, before I pay you for everything that you have uh, by this composer for cello. And uh, the lady wrote me uh, back with a phone picture. I was like, this is it. This is the first page to this piece. And that was an amazing feeling uh, after almost six years. I didn't tell her that I was actually like trying to compare a, another manuscript I, because I, the less information I gave at that point, the better. I just I asked just straight up for a phone picture of the first page of the piece. Yeah, that's that is some amazing research. You uh, you are one of the most seasoned performers, definitely, um, in terms of research that I've worked with with an archive and definitely um, one of the most persistent in 
in uh, making certain archives respond to you. Um, we don't have that much time left, so could um, we'll have to have you back to talk about Marie Seisenberg. Um, but can you talk a bit about, just a little bit, about what you're doing uh, in honor of Marie Seisenberg this year? So this year marks the 50th anniversary of Marie Seisenberg's death. And uh, I am planning to do a few recitals with music that uh, was uh, uh, dear to him, or at least it, it seemed like it was dear to him. Uh, pieces that he uh, played almost every concert, like uh, Bach, uh, that was his favorite. Uh, actually, he came around the time when that was Bach's 200th anniversary of his death. Uh, so there was a lot of Bach celebration around the 1950s. So I'm hoping to play one of the Gamba sonatas uh, for the recital. Also, another piece that appeared a lot was the five pieces uh, in the folk style by uh, Schumann, uh, or as it was called in the newspaper, five pieces in the popular mood. Um, so I'm going to do that and also hoping to do some pieces like this Born Shine, uh, Appalachian Legends, as well as a, a couple other uh, manuscripts that have not, that to my knowledge, either have not been performed either by him or have not been performed since the 1940s, like the Victor, uh, not Victor, Vladimir Padua uh, uh, meditation and uh, John Duke uh, dialogue. Uh, those are really nice pieces, both short pieces, uh, around three, two to three minutes long. Uh, so, uh, and also uh, his bread and butter, the Baccarini, or as I like to call it, the Macarini cello concerto. Uh, not truly, uh, the music is all Baccarini, but uh, the way it was treated is uh, very uh, late romantic German. So uh, relearning that uh, for a concert in October. So excited to uh, dip myself into the world of Eisenberg repertoire right now. That's pretty much uh, all, my, all I'm practicing with the exception of Durafle Requiem that I'm performing tomorrow. But once that's done, I uh, should be completely immersed in, uh, uh, in Eisenberg's repertoire for the rest of the year. That is fabulous. And we're going to have you back to talk about that at some point. Um, I want to thank you for talking with us today and open up chat if anyone has any questions. It was a, a pleasure to, to talk and I, I would love to answer any questions uh, anyone has. Or if you're too shy to publicly uh, ask, uh, then uh, just email me. I, I'm happy to uh, to talk to you privately about uh, any research, any anything uh, that has to do with uh, uh, expanding your repertoire, uh, choosing uh, an edition of that repertoire, or maybe you want to make your own edition of this repertoire. So we have a question. Do you ever return to your rock jazz roots and play any popular type music? So I, uh, uh, I, as a composer, I, I've slowed down a lot. I have not composed 90 cello concertos to date, uh, <laughs> but uh, I do uh, infuse uh, some of uh, the current pop sounds into, uh, uh, into my compositions, uh, which you can hear in uh, the latest piece uh, from 2020, Kohelet. Um, the passion of pop and Shostakovich you can hear, and also Jewish chant. We enjoy that. Yeah, any other questions or comments in the chat? All right, I promise to get you out by one o'clock and I think I'm gonna succeed. Thank you so much for talking with us today, and we will talk to you about Maurice Eisenberg. Um, we'll get that scheduled. Thank you so much for talking thank with you. us today. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you, Mac. And thank you, everyone, for joining us.